Welcome back to the L.A. Jackson Show. Hey, this is a special edition. We're kicking off a great week. And uh, so what we've got this uh, on this show is the Wall of Fame. And today's special, special guest, I'd like to bow down and give all praises. Thank you for joining me, Miss Sharon Brown. How are you doing today? Very well. Blessings to you, L.A. Thank you again. Thank you again for the love and all the support. You know, I really appreciate it, and this is an honor to be here with you. You caught me in motion, so there may be a little bit of background noise here, but we're going to do the best we can. Well, that's fine. We'll just call it some sound effects, and, uh, you know, it'll liven up the show. <laughs> all right, you know, all right. Well, that's cool. So your big hit was I Specialize in Love back in the 80s. And I tell you what, just personally, that was one of my favorite tracks on the planet. I have to always stop what I'm doing every time I hear it. And uh, I keep it in my playlist. I love it. Uh, what was the uh, premise behind that? You, the, you obviously did a couple projects that led up to that. And I know you were the first uh R&B dance artist on, on a hip-hop label called Profile, home of Run DMC. Right, right, right. At the time, I had no idea what was going on. I, think. <laughs> I didn't know about Profile. I knew uh, Run DMC was going to be on the label. I knew that uh, much about hip-hop, actually, at the time. My, uh, my little boy was very little at the time, so he wasn't ready for the hip-hop yet. Mm -hmm. But um, I... Uh, I had got on the label through a management company, and um, they made a deal with Profile and turned down Warner Brothers, and I had no idea that uh, Warner Brothers had wanted to actually put the song out, but, um, you know, history. So anyway, it was put out with Profile, and um, it was the first um, R&B dance artist on the label, and Corey Robbins uh, actually walked around with that record. Um, in his hand, club to club, DJ to DJ. Wow. Yeah, requesting the spin, and, you know, and that's how he did it. I mean, I, I went with him a few times, and, you know, a lot of times the DJ says the artist is with you, and Corey will say, yeah, you know, I get up, I make an appearance, and, I mean, we really did the footwork for the promotion on that song. Uh, I witnessed that, and I was very impressed with Corey nice. and his dedication to making that record a hit. So, was it uh, something where, after a significant amount of clubs were playing it, it finally forced it onto radio, or did radio follow shortly thereafter? Well, actually, it had been a uh, British import. It had already broken over in the UK. Oh, okay. And, yeah, it was, uh, it was climbing very, very fast in the UK where it was in the top 10, so uh, they did a British import. When it came here to the U.S., uh, it was virtually already a hit, but someone who needed to break it in the U.S. And of course, I'm a New Yorker, and everything we did was in New York City, so right. the only logical person to go to was WBLS and Frankie Carter. Right. And I said, <laughs> yeah, so that's what we did. We went to have a uh, meeting with Frankie Carter, and uh, my management sat with them, they did what they did. Um, I was in Harlem at the time, at a couple of party with my sister. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was Valentine's Day, and you know, we go over together, you know, talking about chocolates and flowers. We had the BLS radio blasting in the back, and all of a sudden Frankie comes on and says, we have a Valentine's gift to all of you from a brand new artist on the profile label. Happy Valentine's Day, Miss Sharon Brown, and I specialize in love. And we just roared, and I mean, we jumped up and down. It was a total, total surprise. Nice. Total surprise. But Frankie Parker got hold of the record. He promoted it. Once in New York said, this is it. The rest of the country followed. 
Uh, the rest of the country just followed, but it was Frankie Crocker that wrote that song here in the state. Nice. Starting in New York. Nice. You know, I grew up in, in, in Brooklyn, and I remember those days. I left in... Uh, in 1980, though, and moved out to L.A. for a couple of years, but uh, certainly uh, before the record hit, I was uh, definitely listening to WBLS and Frankie Crocker, and i tell you what, he's just a great guy, father of a lot of different things. He was a, you know, a great idol of mine on the radio side, and uh, I, I remember what made him special to me is that he used to play this song before he came on. I think it was a um, Moody's... Uh, blues or something like that there i go there i go it was so cool uh -huh. and uh, i thought that was really really a unique thing about him and uh, I, I know he yeah. broke a lot of records but i'm just thankful that he broke your record in particular because like i said yours is when i think about my my good good old days in the 80s that's what i think about is i specialize in love and other songs that came out right around then um, it was a time, and uh, it was like the end of an era, the beginning of a new era, all mixed up in one. And unfortunately, a lot of artists, such as myself, we had hit records during that transition. Uh -huh. And it, it was like, what do you do now? Because uh, it was very hard for those same dance artists, R&B artists, mm -hmm. that had dance hits to... To, you know, to transform and, and, and move on into right. the next generation. It was very hard for them to do that. They all, the public only wanted to hear the old stuff. Then they categorized them as classic dance artists or classic this or classic that, mm -hmm. oldies this and oldies that. And before you know it, you're in that group. And it's not what you were striving to do. Right. And it's like a shock to a lot of the artists. It's a real shock to a lot of them, and I've seen it, and it's, you know, it's really sad because uh, it, it alters the personality and people believe the height, you know, and I'm trying to say, I've always said it from day one, every time, since I got in the game, I, every artist I ever encountered, I'd always say, you know, we're all in this together, we're all in the same boat. And very few out there realize what that meant. Very few, very few. A lot of them are just chasing the fame, chasing the game and caught up and, you know, just confused and out there, but um, the music has changed. It, it, it's not so much that, um, you know, there, there's no good artists or, or, or songwriters or producers. It's just that the game has changed with the people in charge, the people at the top, the people that says yay or nay, right. we sign or we not sign. That game has really, really become vicious because and I don't even want to get all the way into that because it's a very dangerous, oh, yeah. very I know. dangerous scenario. Uh, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, I was... Oh, it's so dangerous, yes. I was very shocked myself because, you know, I worked at Sony Music for 10 years down here in Atlanta. And, um, you know, uh, an hour west of Atlanta is Carrollton, Georgia, and that's where the Carrollton plant was. And I, I, I was blessed to have taken a tour of the plant uh, a couple of times, actually. But uh, that plant was huge. I mean, it covered a lot of uh, acreage, and they made records, tapes, and CDs from scratch. And it was just a big shock to me to hear that they closed it down. I mean, it's like a big, empty warehouse now. Wow. Well, well, I, um, I had my early days, and thank God, I'm going to talk over here. I've had my early days. Um, with some very, very good people in this business. I was very fortunate, very blessed to have that happen. Yeah. But um, back in the day, my first uh, professional company was always uh, CBS Records, and that's where I learned, you know, a lot of the publishing and the songwriting aspect and the producing aspect of it, because I eventually came in through the back door. That's um, right. I came in, and yeah, I did. I came in as a songwriter. Mm -hmm. uh, no one else was uh, really taking me seriously as an artist because I've always been a rebel. So, right. You know, you're, you're a rebel. You look like a rebel, and I had the wild, <laughs> yeah. you know, the Hendrix look, and yeah. you know, I'm like, oh shoot, you know, and there was no taming me. You could see that. That was very obvious. That's right. So, uh, you know, the songwriting was okay. I was, I was good with that. But no one knew I could sing until I started uh, doing all the demo work for different artists. And I, my first project was Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Right. What and year I was that? Hospital. 
Yeah. What, what year was that? Was that? Rock Say again? What, what year was that? Oh, let's see. Uh, let's wait and see. It must have been, uh, 73, 74. Okay. Somewhere around there. It's all on YouTube. Um, I had a, they did an album called Mirror's Image. Okay. And at the time, Powell had left, and they got a new lead singer. His name was Jerry LaCroix. He used to be the lead singer for Rare Earth. And at that time, I was very rock influenced anyway, so I was a perfect fit when I came in and um, introduced myself to their producer uh, by the name of Hank Cosby. Okay. And Hank Cosby was a producer from Motown, early Motown. He was uh, the guy you hear on the saxophone solos. Yeah. Uh, that's him. Yeah, he produced Stevie Wonder. Nice. Uh, so Hank was a very intricate part of the Motown family. So when he left, and joined the CBS family. I was able to be fortunate enough to actually bum rush the session and <laughs> introduce myself. That's so, <laughs> so cool. they didn't invite me, trust me. They did not invite me. So I came up to the studio and introduced myself and from that point on I proved myself and uh, I was able to get a song released on the Mirror Gimme the album, uh it's called Love Looks Good on You. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing the background as well. Nice. And that was a lot of fun. I got a lot of, come on guys, I got a lot of experience through that and had my first professional paycheck from CBS and I got to uh, get a new um, client, which was uh, Ronnie Dyson. He, yeah, we wanted to Ronnie Dyson had been signed to CBS and they wanted to take Ronnie in a new direction. Okay. Oh, okay, so new direction meant the new girl on the block was Sharon Brown, songwriter. Nice. She can take them in a new direction. So they gave me the assignment, and uh, I took it graciously and uh, started writing and uh, recording demos. And then, uh, let me see, Ronnie had a problem with um, his mom. They were very close. And the company was saying, well, she's a bit too close. So she on my way before I go in and handle business. I'm still on the phone. I'm um, sorry, Mr. LA. That's right. But anyway, yeah, so they wanted to separate Ronnie from his mom and felt that they would get a better performance in the studio with him. So we decided to take it from New York City and record him in LA. So that was my first trip at the uh, expense of CBS to fly me out of the city. Okay. Sent me over to LA, stayed over in Westwood, and uh, said we will do Ronnie Dyson out there. So, okay. I'm writing, I'm trying to get all this stuff together, and uh, I go pick Ronnie up from the airport, and I ordered a car service. <laughs> I said, uh, I need a car service, I need a limo, pick me up here in Westwood, take me to LAX, we're going to pick up a recording artist that we're recording, Ronnie Dyson, the guy from Broadway Hit Hair, yeah, I played it up, oh, wonderful, what, so they came to get me, I go out to get Ronnie, I had a role for him, and he, when he came out, he was like, Sharon. Well, you came in a limo to get me up here. You want to talk to We get ready to rock the world with you right now, baby. Yeah, get it. That's right. <laughs> we had so much fun. He was like, oh, man, you know these people don't do me like this. They don't do me like this, yeah. I said, I know, I know. I'm on the other side. I'm watching how they, you know, how they play the game. Uh -huh. I see what they do to the black artists. I see who gets the money. I see it. I see it. Trust me. I see it. I said, mm -hmm. but we got, we got this assignment right here. So come on. We got you. So right, I take him to the street. Uh, we go to the supermarket. I fix him homemade meals. We don't do no takeout. Wow. And, um, yeah, I treat him real good. And I felt very honored to be in his presence because he had such a marvelous talent. So I got him in the studio. We started, I did all the demos. We go in the studio and I meet all the musicians and I just, pass out all the sheet music nice. and everyone's giving me their phone numbers and addresses and you don't do that because there was an agent that put that whole thing together and if I'm getting everybody's phone number who the hell needs the agent? Exactly. So, yeah, so I mean there was a lot of like hating and daggers going on until finally Hank took me to the side and told me a lot of people were getting upset you know about me getting in contact with all these people you know and um, so I said well it's a little late now because everyone's giving me their contact but thanks for the <laughs> Heads up, now I know how to conduct myself for the next session. Right. Serious. That's Nothing nice. I can do about that now. Because I'm green to the game, too, so thank you. So, uh, you know, that went on. But we got some really good music out of Ronnie. And uh, then uh, we got him back into New York, and something happened with the uh, CBS and Ronnie's 
relationship, and they decided to take his entire album and shelf it. Oh, wow. And it was sitting terrible. there for, yeah, sitting there. I did like five, uh, I did half the LP. Five songs I submitted to PBS and April Blackwood Publishing for Ronnie, and with me singing all five of them. So they have material on me as well. Mm-hmm. Sitting on the show that was intended for Ronnie Dyson. Well, did you get and, paid? Um, I mean, you, you got paid something? Oh, well, yeah, I still got paid for the assignment. Okay. I got paid for the assignment, but there's no payment for the song. Right, the, the publishing. Not been released right, yeah. And I didn't get any advance on publishing at all, but, okay. I mean, the assignment, I did walk away with that money, but at, at the same time, I was a little uncomfortable knowing that I left all that behind on their show. Yeah, all and that they energy. Made yeah, they made them well sure that um, they didn't want me to have copies because I had copies of it for many years. And uh, somehow one day I ran into some people over at the uh, April Blackwood in, in New York and um, they had requested the tape. And somehow, I, I don't know what I did, but somehow it landed in their hands and I never had a, a backup. So I didn't have any more copies of Aww. it. But uh, it's still sitting there somewhere in there, and it's, I guess it's all Sony Music now. Everything merged together. Yeah. So I guess it's all there. But that was my 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 beginnings with um, songwriting, and I was singing all the demos. Okay. And after I did that, after I did that, I went on to do other projects. Well, um, well let's talk about those I'm, other projects as soon as we come back. Right now, uh, for those people that don't know what I specialize in love is, you what probably one of your biggest hits, let's go on and play that song right now and uh, let them uh, check it out. I, I, and I just can't never get enough of it anyway myself. I appreciate it.
great classic. That song's going to live forever and ever and ever and ever. What, what, um, how did that come about? What, what um, uh, made you come up with uh, that song? Well, actually, um, I was in New York City. I had left Boston where I went to school at in Massachusetts, and you earned all my stripes. But uh, I came back to New York City with my um, husband, my second husband, and we had just had a baby boy. And I was pretty burnt out, shell-shocked, um, afraid of my own home now, which is New York City. I was just afraid to be on the sidewalk, walking on the subway. I was afraid because I seemed to attract all the nuts in the city. They would always <laughs> kick me out and, and, yeah, and chase me or try to uh, ask me for money or whatever. And I couldn't just get rid of them with a polite get out of here or whatever. So it got to the point where I became very paranoid. And... Um, so I just stopped pursuing my career as an independent artist. I just stopped, and I fell in love, and I, will, I had a little boy in my, my conscience, and, and all of my efforts were about being a good mom and a wife to my husband. But he knew better, and uh, we couldn't have peace in, in Massachusetts because everyone was against the relationship, so we decided to go to New York City. Okay. And uh, while we're in New York, we're in the village sitting in the car, and I was eating actually a meatball sub, and my husband was reading the newspaper uh, backstage, the trade magazine. And um, he found an ad in there um, saying that they needed a tall, uh, uh, thin black female vocalist with a willowy voice. And if you if you if you fit this description, call in because we have a production deal already set to go. So my husband said, Sharon, this is you. This is you right here. I can feel it in my bones. This is you. Get out. Call this number. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm not answering any ad on the newspaper. No, thank you. I don't want no part of that. No. No, 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 no. That's another trap that's <laughs> trying to hold me down. He says, no, Sharon, I'm telling you this is it. This is it. Go and call these people. So I said, okay. I get out the car, but I'm really paranoid because I'm thinking that somebody on this busy street in the village is going to come and approach me, and I'm just not ready for it. So I get out the car reluctantly, and I, I put the money in the pay phone. I'm looking to see if my husband is still watching me in the car, and he was. So I called the number, and they answered. It was Eddie O'Loughlin from um, Next Plateau. Wow. Um, and, and he answered, and I answered to tell him I was that woman that they were looking for. And, uh, of course, they thought that was humorous, and he says, well, you have to come and see us in person and bring us your music. And I said, well, unfortunately, my music is in Massachusetts. I'm in the village right now. He said, well, go get your music and come, come see us at YZ on this day. So I says, okay. But then I see this guy, this, this, this guy, this really bummy guy at the end of the block, and he had this gray and silverish-looking long, straggly hair, and he deep, deep blue, bright eyes. And he's walking up and he's bothering people, asking them for money. Oh, boy. And he sees me. He spots me. Eye to eye contact. I'm saying, oh, Jesus, to myself. Sure enough, I turn my back. Here he comes. He comes <laughs> right up to me and says to me, give me some money. I said, I don't have any money. Come for me. And he said, I said, give me some money. Mm. I said, Mr. Please, get away from me. I have no money. He said, he stepped right up to my face where I could feel his breathing on my nose. Ooh. And says, I said, give me some money. And I don't know what happened, but I just snapped. And I said, if you don't get away from me, I'll beat the hell out of you with this telephone. <laughs> and I raised the phone with this people up. And I said a few other choice words to the guy. Mm -hmm. And he jumped back. And he said, all right, lady, all right. I looked at my husband, and he's in the car laughing, laughing away. And when I got back in the car, I said, I told you these people are crazy out here. I told you. He said, yeah, baby, they're crazy. He said, but you ready. You ready for it. And what they say at the, at the phone call, I said, well, they want us to come in X, Y, Z. He said, we got to turn around right now. And he did. He turned that car around. We got on 95 North and went right back to Massachusetts, went into the store, said, pick up my music, got back in the car, grabbed my leather suit, and I dressed on the way back in the back seat of the car what? and made the appointment. Yeah, it was wild. It was wild. I walked in there and I had these leather pants. I looked like someone painted them on me. <laughs> and got yeah, with your yeah. Fine you know, self. I stand up on six feet tall with shoes and stuff, so I had these real tight leather pants on, I'm thin as a rail, I have the leather jacket on, I have all this wild crazy hair. Oh yeah, rock I star. In. Yeah, I walk in, I give them the music, and then my friends over at CBS had already told them 
what are you interviewing today? And they said, yeah, who are you interviewing? And they said, a girl named Sharon Brown coming in from Massachusetts. They said, Sharon Brown? Oh, yeah, that's the one you want. That's the one you want. She not only sings, but she's a hell of a songwriter. Mm-hmm. So by, by the time I got there, they had already known that they were going to kick me. I didn't know that. So when I gave them the demo and we talked and they said, okay, we'll get back to you, I figured it was the same old, same old, but it wasn't. Um, before I had turned the car back around, by the time we got back to Massachusetts, we had already got a call that I was going to be the girl that they wanted to put on these four demo tracks that they had, one of which the songs was I Specialize in Love. Another song was Say La Vie from uh, Chuck Berry. Oh. Uh, another one from Creedence Clearwater uh, Revival, uh, Down on the Corner. Oh. And uh, another one that uh, Chrissy Houston did, did uh, Whitney Houston's mother sang, uh, uh, Love Don't Hurt People, which was an import. And those were the four songs they, they had me do. They didn't know what direction they were going to be able to break me in, uh-huh. but they knew I could break in any of those categories. Nice. So they took a shot. Yeah, they had all four lined up. But when they dropped um, I Specialize in Love, that was the one that took off. That's that was it. They, they didn't even get a chance to drop the other three. That's amazing. That is nice. So that's, that, that's a good segue that we could go back and pick up on, um, you know, when CBS shelved those songs that you worked uh, with Ronnie Dyson and everything. Have you ever thought uh-huh. about maybe going back and uh, just redoing and making new recordings of those songs since they kind of got lost in the uh, abyss? As a songwriter, I most definitely do think about those things all the time. It's just that I am still a struggling artist. I don't have the bank. I don't have Richard Branson backing me up anymore with Virgin Records. Matter of fact, he's running around with Kelly Rowland now, so I'm huh? really out the loop. Wow. <laughs> you know, but he was the one that hosted me in, in my first trip to, to the UK. Okay. Uh, and um, so, um, yeah, it takes it takes a little dough. I mean, they tell you that, you know, you can protect yourself and copyright your material and you do this, that, and the other, but you can't copyright an idea, so yeah. you gotta be very careful who you share your ideas with, yep. because you can't copyright ideas. Right. And uh, then the other thing is that, they're talking about copyright, you know, you want about 12 songs, 12 to 20 songs on a uh, LP, and each song, or you can try to do it as a book, but usually, you know, you have to copyright all the songs as you, you know, start presenting them to the public, so... It's like the poor man's copyright where you, you know, mail everything to yourself, right. registered, and don't open it. Does you that know, really work? You know, to rip you off. But, but it's a lot of money to, to, to uh, copyright a song. Right. Now, does mailing that to yourself actually work? I, I think I did that one time when I was starting off with uh, songwriting, too. Uh, but does that actually work? Yes, that works. If you have it mailed to yourself with the poor man's copyright, registered where you signed for it, the postman brings it to you, you have to sign for it and get a receipt for it. You take the green receipt, you put it, you file that away. Okay. Because so that's usually what you need to, to show that it was uh, signed for when delivered to you on this particular date. You save the green card, but then the envelope itself with your music in it, uh, in hard copy CDs and, and lyric sheets and whatever else you want to put in there. Um, you don't open it. You file that away. Okay. Also, okay. you don't open it. Now, if any time someone uses any of the material or the production uh, that you had just sent to yourself at any time, um, you and you hear about it, you know, that's the thing now. you got to hear about it. Right. And uh, if you hear about it, you can file charges. You can go to the Artist Rights Foundation with your evidence. Let them go after you, after, you know, your money for you, because uh-huh. that's what they do. Right. Um, they've been getting money for a lot of the classic artists from the 50s and from the 60s, and uh, a few people I know from the 80s and the 90s, you know, trying to get their performance royalties and songwriting royalties and all sorts of things. Because during that time, people were just putting producers and DJs and, 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 and songwriters were just putting out music and didn't even have an artist. They would make up an artist's name and have somebody come you know, like myself or Carol Douglas or Fonda Ray, yeah. uh, you know, Tom Gardner, you know, Carol Williams from Salso, even uh, uh, Lolita Holloway. They would call, you know, have them come in, Martha Walsh. They would come in and do all the vocals and get paid for the session, but the damn song would be released under somebody else's name. A lot of people say, well, damn, that sounds like Martha Walsh. Well, damn, don't that sound like so you know, but yeah. with somebody else, but they were just producing songs. They weren't right. promoting artists. I remember There's a one big of, difference. 
I, I, would, I remember when I was with Sony, it, it was a situation like that with CNC Music Factory and Martha Wash. Exactly. 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 Black Box. The whole thing. Uh, it, it was, uh, it, yeah, it was a lot of that going on because they were not producing artists at the time. They were producing songs. Exactly. They were putting songs out there, getting that publishing money, getting the songwriters money, making producers famous, making DJs famous. And now look where we're at. DJs are getting more money now today than the artists themselves. Wow, that is really something else. Well, now, that's the truth. The DJs are traveling all over the world, spinning our music, our music, everyone's music. I mean, I'm not, I'm not mad at them. You know what I'm saying? But they are. It's the truth. The truth. They are out there traveling all over the world, getting big, big dollars, spinning our music. Cutting it up, remixing all kinds of stuff. I went to a uh, a rave, and that was like a three day party, really. And uh, the guys were spinning music. But on top of that, what I noticed was that they also had music instruments too. You know? Yes. But now let let's talk about something. When you mentioned Fonda Ray, I remember when I first found you on Facebook. I just lost my mind, and we started talking. But uh, you mentioned that you were doing a project with some other classic ladies, like Melba Moore and Linda Clifford, and everything. Is that still going oh, on? Yeah. You still guys is still in touch with each other? Well, we no, it's not not with me. But let me just make that clear. Not with me. Not at the moment because that's a, they've gone and moved on and did other projects. With other people, um, they have some things out that uh, right now uh, they're promoting, and Linda's doing her thing, and Linda's another great songwriter too. So they're all doing their own thing, trying to get it, to, you know, get it together, whatever their goals are. Um, for me, and, and we're living on in different parts of the country. I'm in touch with Carol Williams, um, and I'm in touch with uh, Fonda, you know, from time to time, mm -hmm. but. Everyone's doing their own thing, and it was a, at one time Melba Moore's manager, Ron Richardson, was uh, trying to organize a, you know, some sort of a diva explosion show because he was in touch with all of us. But as I said, it's so many different personalities in different parts of the country and expense that it's some of it, sometimes we were able to work together, and most times we weren't. And then some of the promoters would give, you know. The people that represented us, uh, you know, trouble like, uh, well, this one only has one hit record, and this one only has a one hit record, and this one here, you know, uh, you know, all of this stuff. So it made it difficult for agents to continue to book for your fee because the 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 the, the venue would come back with, well, uh, it only has one hit record, so. It's really not worth me paying all that money, you know. That that's what started happening, and it was like really, really an insult. But that's what just what happened. So a lot of the artists that had all those huge records uh, kind of faded away because they weren't vi viable. I mean, they weren't making any money for an agent. No one was getting their twenty percent. No one was getting their ten percent. No one was getting their fifteen percent. Oh no one was doing hair and makeup. Nobody was designing clothes. Nobody was driving, you know, where it was like, it, it was dried up. There was nothing there to make money. And that's the only reason they pay attention to you is because the, you are making money. You are generating lots and lots of money. If you're generating the money, they'll be there to do what's necessary. And sometimes and most times they'll do what's not necessary. But they are there as long as you're generating the money. They're not generating any money. They're not there. And uh, they will block you from generating money. Like I said before, a lot of the classic artists uh, remain classic artists because venues and promoters will only uh, back up and support and promote what they last know you by. In my case, they'll stick with 1982, even though this is 2013. That's amazing. Uh, we want to know what's been going on between... 82 and now, I mean, uh, I mean, really, I don't understand it, but that's what we're all faced with. So as an independent artist, uh, I found it more gratifying to pick and choose the music that I like, pick and choose the music I want to record, uh, pick and choose um, 
the music that um, I felt was the cause of the people at the time, because my whole approach was about being a message artist and not just uh, a hard assist, an artist that's hopping around just dancing and selling sex. Right. And, uh, yeah, I didn't, I never wanted that image. Wow. Even though my management at the time wanted to promote me as some sort of a sex symbol, <laughs> I just was, I was just a bit too rebellious, uh, too militant to fit the role. <laughs> just didn't work. Wow. That's amazing. It didn't work. And there's, yeah. a, there's another uh, little uh, trio. I think they were trying to promote themselves together. Um, it was, a, and I met them a couple of years ago too. It was like a, a Ray Charles' daughter and BB King's daughter and uh, someone else's daughter. Um, he had a big hit. I think the Midnight Hour. Who sung the Midnight Hour? Wilson Pickett. Yeah, yeah. His uh, Safon Pickett, his daughter. That's right. And. Uh, uh, Miss Angela Moore and big ups to her she's a good friend of mine she's a publicist down here and she's been working with them to try to do something and get them on the road but again you know just like you said it's all about the you know conceptions and stigmas and once people see you a certain way they want to try to keep you in that in that little area and that that's that that doesn't leave much room for growth yeah I know it's just a it's like uh people who are not really people, they're sheeple, and the ones in power, they direct it. It's right over here, please. Uh, they, um, they direct the traffic, so to speak. Mm. You know, they direct the climate. Yeah. Uh, they dictate the weather. Man. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of forces that are in play that, unfortunately, a lot of the artists are just completely unaware of. Well, we're going to... Uh, go, go on. Well, it's just there's so many of them are lost out there in the game. A lot of them just lost, and it's unfortunate. So I, I am an independent artist, and I'm grateful to be able to do that. I it's hear very you. important. Now, so as much of yourself as you can. Where are you with, um, are, are you doing anything where you try to um, uh, link across the music boundaries? In other words, are you doing any kind of work uh, with, say, any of the uh, hip-hop artists or the uh, up, uh, the new, you know, the Beyonce's and Sierra's of the world? Are you doing anything where you're bridging the gap between the old and the new? Well, um, I was doing sort of some of that different genres of music. Uh, I did some things with a British group. They were drum and bass called Easy Rollers, the letter um, E, letter Z, Easy Rollers. And okay. I invited Dougie Fresh. So we did something old school meets new school drum and bass for the UK. It was nice. released and it's all on YouTube. I did a few things with them. And uh, then the hip hop thing, well, I had two sons, a couple of nephews, they came to me and they wanted to do some stuff. So they have some stuff out now called It's Mine Entertainment and it's out on some of the uh, Facebook pages and SoundCloud. Okay. And uh, so I'm getting behind some of that and uh, I've gone to a couple of clubs to see their showcases and whatnot, made a few contacts, but they want me to manage and I have to, you know, give it some more thought as to what they're doing, what they want to do. And what can I do and how much can I put up with because these are all young people. Right. And, uh, my, and I'm old school for real. So right. That, you know, I'm giving that some thought. But then the uh, Beyonce's and the Sierra's and stuff like that, that to me is just something that it takes me back to CBS. If, if they ever said, hey, uh, we heard you're a songwriter, can you write a song with this title? Can you write a song with this story? Uh, for this artist, for Sierra, for Beyonce, for Rihanna, can you do? That's what I was trained to do. Gotcha. I, I automatically that's a that's just a job for me, and and I love doing it. I have stuff that I can write on anyone. I'm a serious songwriter, and I can fit the story however you want it to go. So that's what I do. I can write songs in my sleep, but I'm worried about that. So I do partner with various um, artists that want to do so and this latest project I did with uh, Bob Marley's guitarist Junior Marvin nice now yeah so that's the latest project that I've um, 
embarked on, and I have a track from Flying Robbie, so I'm doing some things uh, uh, that are uh, dance hall, that some of them are just straight reggae, and some of them are a continuation to what Bob was writing about, some of his biggest hits that I was asked to write something in those veins, nice. which I did do. So that's going to be probably something Junior Marlin is going to be coming out with his, uh, his new uh, LP probably this fall, and he did tell me he's shooting for the fall. Nice. But um, other than that, um, I'm still concentrating on my own. Okay. Um, I just released a full CD out on Amazon. It's called Sharon Brown. I specialize in love. Give love a chance is the name of the LP. Oh, good. And you know we're going to clo uh, close out our interview a little bit later on with with that song, as a matter of fact. I was just mentioning that we are going to uh, play your uh, current single, Give Love a Chance, a little bit later on, so I'm looking forward to uh, putting that on and letting everybody hear where you are now. And I was on the Internet the other day going through stuff, and I was like, you know, I kept, uh, I think the other song, Thinking of You, which we're going to play next, uh, it's got like some reggae flavor to it. Oh, yeah, the remix you're doing. The Jersey Maestro remix? Yeah, yeah. Uh, set that up, because we're going to go on and jump on and play that right now. Okay, well, actually, Thinking of You was a writing assignment. A track was sent to me from the UK, from the group Easy Rollers. And they, um, it was just a, 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 a gesture of gratitude. They sent me a track that probably thought I'd like and could write. And uh, I came home from work one day and listened to the track. And I started laughing. I said, what are these guys trying to do? Kill me? The track was 9,000 miles per hour. Uh -huh. I said, my God, yeah. So my son started laughing. So I took my coat off, sat down, and got into the uh, moment of the track and uh, came up with uh, a nice New York themed song, Thinking of You. It's basically about the New York City skyline and a, a young lady or a man being kind of lonely and lost. And you just go out and get the New York City, you know, hot spot. And basically a celebration of New York and your freedom because you're in the greatest city in the world. And that's basically the song, Thinking of You. Cool. And uh, we did it in the UK. We released it, you know, one way. And then uh didn't do very much. A lot of people, thank you, a lot of people liked it. So uh, I met a friend of mine who was into reggae music at one of the concerts I did in New Jersey, Jonathan Kisselik. And... Uh, he had contact with Jersey Maestro, and they were really, really good uh, musicians. So long story short, he put us together, and they heard Thinking of You, and they came back with this Jersey Maestro remix version. I thought it was fabulous, so that was the version that I released myself and continued to promote. Now, that's on, a, on the Cyber uh, Jam um, website on the Cyber Jam label, rather, on TrackSource. Over on TrackSource, there's a label called Cyber Jam. And they have the Thinking of You with all, oh, I guess, 20-something mixes, remixes from DJs all over the world. They wow. came in and offered their services and remixed that song. We have Miami mix. We have the dance mix. We have the reggae mix. We have there's a thousand different mixes all on one disc, which you can get from... Um, Cyber Jams, which is, all, uh, I think he still has it up on track, so you can buy the whole, um, 20 remixes. Well, let's check, that song. let's check it out. Thinking of you. Okay. Thinking of you. Jersey Mike
Now that kind of reminds me. I'm I'm working with this cat named Stephen Stone, and he was uh -huh. uh, known with uh you know Rough House Records and Criss Cross, the Fuji, Cypress Hill, Lauren Hill, and uh, right uh -huh. now. Uh, we're, we're doing some work together uh, with Marosa Beer and uh, the first women in history or first artist to own a beer company called Anything But... Well, the girls group is called Anything But Monday. But the funny thing is, and that that's something you were saying that reminded me of that, is the remixes. that These girls are well known for, you know, lots of DJs doing remixes to their songs and putting them out. Uh -huh. And their current song's called 99 Bottles of Beer. But again, they've got, if you go online, they've got tons of mixes by particularly a lot of European DJs. So I just want right. to ask you, is that where uh, things are going now, is just to have songs with a bunch of remixes and mixes so that you can have maximum impact and uh, appeal to a lot of different audiences? Well, that was the idea uh, a few years back when I first started it, but um, that's not basically how it is. Um, that's not basically where it is now. Hold on, I'm inside of a store. Um, that's basically not what it is now for me. Um, I'm just happy to be able to create new music and be able to have the Internet as a complete tool mm -hmm. and remain an independent artist. Right. And release the music to a fan base that I have built over, thank you, uh, the last 30 something years. Okay. And, um, so I'm very grateful for that. It's a great position to be in. Um, independent artists, uh, have to work harder. Yeah. They really do. They have to work harder and, uh, every day grind if you're trying to, uh, there's a particular goal that I don't know what you're trying to do, a uh, top 40 hit or, uh, trying to generate good, whatever the goal may be, the independent artist definitely has to work harder toward that. Oh, yeah. Um, at this point, I, my, my performance, um, roster is labeled special occasions. I'm not trying to kill myself flying all over this country. I'm not trying to deal with, uh, Bottom feeders, third party parties, um, I'm just not putting myself through it. Life is too short and I want to enjoy it. And they have a tendency in this business to suck the essence of you right, right out of you. To suck the life right out of you. Yeah. All for a dollar. So, my, my performance roster is definitely special occasion. And, um, I'm all about raising funds. For pertinent causes. Oh, that's great, great. I went to my service for that. That's Most definitely, but I will not have artists, I mean, um, promoters, call me, email me, find me on Facebook, offer me the sun, moon, and stars. But when it comes down to the real gritty gritty, how much do I make here? Are you going to meet my price? We have a problem. Right. And they want you to sell yourself out. Go against everything that you've already given them in black and white. They want you to go against everything. And their reasoning is, in most cases, um, I can't make that much money or you only had one hit record. My fan base only knows about one hit record. And then I'll tell them, listen, that one hit record, it was one huge one. Uh-huh, sure this, was. My discography, you'll see there's more than one hit record. So, I don't know, independent is the way to go. Yeah. Now, now going back now, was it much of a difference... Uh, you know now how things are compared to, and I, I we failed to mention uh, your your roots, where uh, Phil Medley was your uncle, and he wrote that huge hit "Twist and Shout," and your dad was uh -huh. William Brown. He was a, a, a well known drummer. I mean, uh -huh. were were they were there a lot of independent labels and issues like that back then it, when the music was blowing up with you know rock and roll and you know the fifties and sixties. What's the big difference now? Well, um, the big difference uh, is that anybody and everybody could uh, 
start a business mm-hmm. of any sort with the help of the internet. Okay. That was the best tool. Yeah, that was the best tool for any musician, songwriter, singer, whatever, producer. That was the tool that would allow you to gain your independence, your freedom yeah. of expression. And that's so funny because while the internet was the, the major tool that, that gave the death blow to major record labels and, and now people had the flexibility to listen to more artists than what the labels were shoving down their throat. On the other hand, it was a, the best thing that could have happened to independent artists because it puts everybody on a, a better uh, you know playing level. Exactly. It leveled the playing field for us and uh, that's, the, that, that's basically the difference. That's the main uh, difference. And then, you know, you know the... Um, the business changed anyway. I mean, the record stores were out of business. They're not selling records anymore. And uh-huh. vinyl just played out. And, you know, CDs moved on. Cassettes moved on. Well, so how do you feel about that? How, how, do you huh? feel, how do you feel about that? Because I was uh, talking about that the other day, about with the digital age, while I do like, you know, the flexibility and how fast you could get a song to someone on the other side of the country or even on the other side of the world. But you, you can't touch the records anymore. You can't read the liner notes and all that. How do you feel about the, the transition with it going digital where you can't touch it anymore? That goes with um, doing your homework and research on the internet because there are independent distributors out there that will put your records out as uh, MP3 and if the customer requests a hard copy mm-hmm. they'll get it now that's what I've done with uh, TuneCore I released it through a uh, full CD through TuneCore okay. I have an account with them and it, it went straight to Amazon that's, that's who I have the agreement with Amazon and TuneCore now at Amazon They'll show you the, the full CD from me. They'll allow you to sample and hear all of the songs on the CD. Oh, nice. And you can buy it either as a MP3 download, or you can request a hard copy CD. Nice. And if you request a hard copy CD, there's my information there. Also, if you want me to sign it, make it personal to you, then you have to reach out to me because I am... Everything. I am the artist. I am the producer. I am the label. I'm everything. So nice. you just reach out to me because one of my fans has has done that exactly. Uh, David uh, from Miami. He wanted a hard copy and he wanted a picture and and wanted it signed. So I did and I sent it. He sent me his information. I sent it to him through the via mail. Nice. And he was very very happy and he's a fan and he's, he's following me and 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 giving me all the support that I need because I am as I said an independent artist. Yeah. So but you're yeah, able to get that to get it. You were able to do that when he placed his order before he got it and shipped it back to you. He placed the order and then you were able to sign it and get it all out in the stream without it having to go to him and then come up to you and then go back to him. Yeah. Got it. You have to request it. You have to request that. Okay. You have to request that because they will notify me. Amazon will notify me. I have the single of Give Love a Chance on CD Baby. Now, CD Baby will only give you an MP3 download, but they, they also had physical CD copies from me. Now, whoever requested those CD copies, they're out of stock now. I'm wow. getting emails now from CD Baby saying they need more CDs. Wow. Excellent. So that was a good thing for me, but um, Amazon, I, I I prefer dealing with them because, like I said, if you want an MP3 download, you can. Mm-hmm. If you want a hard copy CD, you'll get that. Nice. That's so cool. That's that's really a, a good product of the technology of today, and um, I'm really hoping that it's going to help artists like you who have been kind of pushed around and you know ignored by the label, uh, by the industry on a big level. That you'll be able to finally get your dues and actually take more control of your destiny. You know. Well, I um, life is is just continual. It's it's it's, it's not waiting on anyone, and nope. I've reached the point where the fame and the the um, the whole concept of trying to make a lot of money and be seen and be here and there and everywhere has totally kind of like escaped me. I'm just living in the moment. I have been blessed with grandchildren and 
great grandchildren and good health. And um, I have nieces and nephews, and my mom's still alive. Nice. You know, I have you know family all over the place, and every day above ground is a good day. So oh yeah, for sure. I'm living in the moment. I, I really have learned to grab hold of the moment. And um, I'm not singing as often as I should or someone thinks I should or, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling it. So I'm obviously I'm, not, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing at the moment because I don't feel a song right now uh, to sing. Uh, but I'm prepared to sing if need be. Right. But I, I don't, I'm not pushing things like that. I'm not pursuing knocking down doors or making phone calls or things of that nature, what I do do is stay behind the material that I've released, mm -hmm. uh, see how it's doing, see the audience that, that, that I'm targeting, uh, who, who's buying it, and, um, you know, I follow it that way and, and, re and emails and answer people if they have questions about it yeah. or if they're requesting photos or something like that, but I have a lot of stuff out there that's really free. That's cool. And, um, yeah, I did. I put a lot of stuff out free. I put a lot of stuff with uh, Reverb Nation, and I, t I teamed up with uh, Fender Corporation, and we split the profits 50-50. I went to number one with them, and then I, I switched up with, with Keep a Child Alive. Uh, we had dropped down to number four, and then I came back up to number one with Keep a Child Alive. So I, I do that every now and then with uh, Reverb Nation, and I put different songs out. And then I, I partner up with people, and, and it's been really pretty good. Um, um, I was staying up in the top ten, number one spot for a while, and um, I just checked it the other day because I haven't been on it for a while, and I was number 11, uh, but I haven't been there for a while, so I'm getting ready to go back and take that music down and put some new music out and, send, and, and probably partner up again with Fender. And, um, and that's also uh, music that people can comment down low for free. Uh, comment on and tell me that it should be released on the label. That's how I do it. I hear what the people are saying and then I'll take that particular song. Like Thinking of You was a, one of those songs. Everyone liked it. I had it tested all over the country. Nice. And they, everyone loved it. So we just went on and had every DJ that wanted to be down and mix it. So there's, like I said, on track for us, there's a um, 20... This, uh, remix of Thinking of You and, you know, Give Love a Chance is a single on CD, baby, but it's also on the LP over at Amazon. You, you can get, you know, I specialize in love, Give Love a Chance, Thinking of You, get all of that in one on disc over at Amazon. Nice. Nice. Well, listen. But I'm happy with the, the internet. It, it, it freed a lot of, uh, creative uh, energy yes it me. did yes it did and then you mentioned family earlier I remember when we were talking on Facebook uh, a while back uh, I think you said you had some family down here in Atlanta does that mean we're going to see you sometime soon well yeah we are planning a family trip great we are, we are, we are planning a family trip to Atlanta um, I do have family there but there's some things up here right now that have to be finalized and put in, you know, we have to organize. We can't just jump out and do anything we feel like it, you know. It has to be organized, and that, that is what we're doing right now, a trip to um, all the way south to Atlanta. Um, I have some people over in Virginia. Junior Martin is down in uh, Alexandria. Okay. Um, I have some people down in Virginia Beach, North Carolina, South Carolina. So we wanted to really incorporate all the way down to Miami. Nice, nice. That sounds like a nice East tour, fa East Coast family tour. Yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to organize right now. So I have the young guys in the family and my nieces and nephews to help me do a lot of stuff because uh, that's the team now. It's not... I have a record company behind me doing this, that, and the other. I am the record company, exactly. so I've got to do what i got to do. Uh-huh. That's so cool. <laughs> Well, listen, I know you're busy. I, I love you to death. I always will. And, uh, you know, just keep up the good work. We're going to close out and go into your, your song, Give Love a Chance. And we're going to close the show out with, with that wonderful tune right there. Uh, you got any closing words, any words of advice or anything like that you want to leave with our listeners on Raw Truth Radio? Well, yes, I would. Um, you know, no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're feeling, no matter what somebody's told you, the bottom line, health is wealth. Health Claim is wealth. It. You posted that on your Facebook the other day. 
all the time. Health is wealth. Claim it. Because without it, you have nothing. I don't care how many hit records you get, how many uh, des uh, lines of designer clothes you have put out, um, how many books you've written, how many marathons you've run. It doesn't matter. If you don't maintain your health, you have no wealth. Nothing else matters. So that's my motto to everyone. Health is wealth. Claim it. That's so nice. That's so nice. And I've got a little motto I like to close out my shows with as well. So uh, what is that? on that note, I just want to say that, remember, God needs us all to do something good for him. But first, we have to do something good for ourselves. And, and you know what that is? Stay healthy. <laughs> that's uh, that's one of those go. things for sure is stay healthy. That's it. Health is wealth. Well, thanks for joining us, Sharon. I specialize in love, Brown. Uh, we hope you could come back again. Uh, we just love you to death. And uh, give the people some contact info. Well, you can reach me at Sharon Ada Brown at AOL.com. I answer all emails. It's Sharon Ada, A-D-A, Brown at AOL.com. I answer all fan mail. That is so cool. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, take care. I love you, girl. And, uh, I love you, Willie. Okay, take care. We'll talk again. And y'all check out Give Love a Chance. Peace. Wonderful. Blessings.